time. Welcome, 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 welcome. Um, every Sunday, uh, we come to church wondering um, who will show online, who will show live and in person. Uh, so it's always, um, I want to say fun, but I'm, I'm not sure that that's the right word. It, it's interesting, might be a better word. It's always interesting to see who will, will join us. Uh, um, I don't recall uh, having, a, having a parking lot uh, anointing pre-church um, ever, um, but I probably have, you know, I just, I just don't recall, so it was kind of a nice way to start the day. Uh, I'm not endorsing that um, you bring your sick into our parking lot and I anoint them pre-meeting, but it really was a wonderful way of um, kind of coming to a sober stop and, and getting ready for the service, so please keep them in prayer as they, as they drive home. Welcome to the Church of Jesus Christ. Uh, and I pray that the Lord blesses you this morning, uh, Sister Patty said, with the Lord's message this morning. Um, you hear that differently than I hear it. When I hear someone pray that way, as I pray as well that way, um, I'm in a swirl. Um, how do I get out of the way? How do I yeah, turn it over to the Lord? How do I allow him to have his way? And um, I see you all, with no insult intended, I see you as baby birds in a nest with your beaks up, ready to be fed, as it should be, just as it should be. Um, and I just pray that I bring the right food to you. And it's, it's the Lord's food and not mine. So God bless you all this morning, and I pray he does. I take all of these um, names that we that you bring to us um, very seriously, and I keep this little book with me during the week and, and continue to pray for you all. Um, so so no, and I see people writing. When, I, when a name is out, I see so many online writing those names down. I see Carly has her book. Um, one of my favorite things that people do uh, during sermons, and um, I don't mean to embarrass, but I see Carly do it. I see analysts, I, but I do see people online doing it as well, taking notes down as it goes, and it gives you um, probably study points and things to to contemplate during the week. And so again, I pray that I bring to you the Lord's words and that I get out of the way. Um, word association time. I'm going to give you one word, and I want you to think of something. The word is rain. And if anyone wants to share what they think of when I say rain, you say, mm, when I, sorry, <laughs> just silliness comes over me. It's just so terrible. But when I say rain, what do you think? Anyone want to take a shot in online or in person? Anyone? Just from being in church, King. Mm -hmm. Refresh. Refresh. Good. Dreary. Dreary. Good. Sorry. Well, not good, but good for good, good interaction. Thank you. <laughs> but that is good. That is, that is good. Dreary. Who else? What'd she say? Umbrella. Umbrella. Yes. Yes. And then I think of the Super Bowl and Rihanna today, who is yeah. singing. So we're going way off the mark. So, so word association can be a curse as well. Anyone else? When I say rain. Well, which rain did you mean? Did you mean rain R A I N or rain R E I G? Join us. Uh, Sister Patty's been in my sermons a little too long. I haven't seen she's fallen into my voice a little too long. Okay, having said that, we're going to shift right to the service. And she gets the thank you, everyone, for participating. But she gets the star on her forehead more than anyone else. And you'll see why. So our theme today is right as rain. Right? As rain. Anyone have any idea where that saying came from? Or even maybe the younger people, especially, maybe everyone may not even know what it means, right? As rain. So, what it means is, and it normally refers to um, when things haven't been good. Someone is not feeling well, and then they give a report later, How are you? Uh, right as rain. It actually, they believe, though they don't know the, the derivative, they believe it comes from the UK, it comes from England. And it's because rain is so frequent in, in the UK that that's a good thing. That's, that The report is all is well. It's your right as rain. So the phrase right as rain actually refers to literally the rain and that rain is right in that, not dreary, but right. <laughs> but if you go to, by the way, if you go to London, one of the things that they say is it's often dreary because of, of the overcast. But Sister Patty hit the home run this morning because you heard right as rain. I gave you that definition, but I didn't say right as rain. I said right as rain. 
Listen, listen. You're, yes, he did. He did with King. I didn't say write his reign. I said write his reign. You hear the difference? No. Yeah, me neither. Anyway, <laughs> R-E-I-G-N, reign. Reign means to rule with sovereign power or authority. Normally, we're thinking of kings or queens. I, I started, I Googled and, and did some searches on rain <clears throat> last night. Um, and normally, um, rain is, is seen in a, um, I want to say positive vein, if you will. But I'm going to um, share later a couple names of those who have reigned. Okay. Today, I'm going to do a little segue and bring you to Rihanna and bring you to what's happening later today. And it's the Super Bowl. So um, on Super Bowl Sunday, there's a thousand questions going today. We're not home. We don't have ESPN on. Trust me when I tell you, if we were home and Candace was in charge of the changer, ESPN would be locked on um, for the day. Uh, so, so we would be hearing the back and forth all day long about it. Who's going to win, Chiefs or Eagles? I'm going to read you a couple stats, and then you can determine yourself. So who will reign as champ this year? Do you, does anyone know anything about the reigning champ up until 6 o'clock or 6.30, whenever the game starts today? Do you know who has been the reigning champ over the last year? Who? LA. LA Rams. Anyone know a little single fact about them and how they did this year? Single worst reigning champ ever. Five and 12 is, I think, a 29% uh, winning rate. Um, the worst reigning champ, Super Bowl champ ever. It's not easy to be champ. It's not easy to reign. It's not easy to hold on to control and power. <clears throat> so today we're asking, and, and that's, that's all that's buzzing this morning. I'm not taking you to ESPN, but I'm going to tell you what's happening. I know these things. They're talking about this. The Chiefs record this year thus far is 16 and three. The Eagles record so far this year, 16 and three. The Chiefs have 546 points scored, but the Eagles have 546 points scored. I didn't say rain, I said rain. I didn't say 546, I said 546. Same exact. Chiefs average 4.6 yards a carry. Every time that someone touches the ball and runs the ball, they get 4.6 yards in the playoffs. The Eagles, every time they run the ball and someone carries the ball forward, they get 4.6 yards carrying. Never has a, a Super Bowl been this close to, to try to guess in advance. Chiefs have four takeaways, interceptions and fumble recoveries in the, in the playoffs. But the Eagles have four takeaways in the playoffs. This is as close as it's ever been. Who's going to reign as champ? What I learned this, this, this last night and today is um, it's not easy to reign. Even in the right definition of reign, it's not easy to reign. I'm going to read you a couple names. And I want you to think about what they have in common. Okay, Attila the Hun. Ten years of invading and terrorizing European countries. Nero, Roman emperor, emperor who victimized specifically Christians. Reigns, these are all reigns. Vlad the Impaler. He is, the, he is supposedly the inspiration behind the writing of Dracula. That's how horrible a man this was. Ivan the Terrible, Russian Tsar for more than 25 years terrorized his own people, trying to bring together a country. Herod, Herod, our own Herod, we read about him in the, in the Bible, right? 40 years of terror in Palestine. Caligula, said to be worse than Nero, or Nero, or depending on who the person is. I used to wear Nero shirts, but I think we're pronouncing Nero. Uh, worse than Nero with a much broader target than just Christians. They were all, everyone was kind of in his, in his range of terror. And the worst of all, Genghis Khan. Early 1200s, 21 years, 12 million square miles of terror is what he did in 21 years, just plowing through countries. Mongolian, by the way. 
So if you go and get Mongolian food, you're doing that in honor of Genghis Khan. I just want to ruin your dinner real quick for you. <laughs> what do all these guys have in common? Our theme today is right as rain. They were wrong as rain. All of them. They were horrible terrorists. And I believe, um, excuse me, I'm repeating what wiser people than I believe, is that power corrupts. And as it says, absolute power corrupts absolutely. All of them felt prey to that. So it's not easy to reign. So what is right as rain and, and how do we get there? Um, most of us, I'm going to I'm going to make a general swipe. Most of us know the difference between right and wrong. Fair, fair assessment, no judgment at, um, in, involved. Most of us know the difference between right and wrong. I have a, a favorite memory with Jeffrey Gennetti, where we began to um, dissect the word of God. And Candace, I, I'm not looking up, but I should. Uh, I was gonna say, probably has a smirk on her face because she remembers when these talks would start about nine o'clock in, in the evening. And she would stay with us for about a half hour and then she'd slowly disappear to the back room and she and she'd go to bed. And if she got up at two, she knew we were still in the living room talking, just going through discussion after discussion. So this one night we were talking about right and wrong. We were talking about black and white. We were talking about the gray space between black and white issues um, because most people say they dwell in the gray area. And we came to the conclusion, right? I don't know if we're right, don't know this. But we came to the conclusion there is no gray area. It's either right or wrong. We have two ears, evil coming in the left side, goodness coming in the right side. There's no gray between the two. Two different opinions trying to tempt us. Uh, I love how they, the writer, it's in Alma, I just don't remember who wrote it. I think it's Alma who said, the enticings of the Holy Spirit. I've never heard the word enticing on a positive spin, so I've always loved that phrase. You're either given to the enticings of the evil one or the enticings of the Holy Spirit, left or right. No great. Again, I'm not saying that definitively. I'm just suggesting that for everyone to think about. Is it true that there really is no gray area? Gray area seems to be where excuses are made. Well, I didn't quite know, so I was kind of in the gray area. And so I got drunk with my friends. That's how that finishes. It started off as just a sip, and then I got out of control. It was a gray area for me. I'm not going to keep naming. I'm going to offend everyone everywhere, so I'm not going to keep naming what the gray area is. It's kind of foolish of me to try to, to attempt that. But we came to this conclusion that we know right from wrong. We spent probably four or five hours defending the two sides or working against one and defending the other. And, try, and we came to the final conclusion. Mm -mm. And we used ourselves as the, as the examples that when we went for the gray area as a as reasoning, it really didn't exist. We knew what was right. We knew what was wrong. I'm going to soften that and take it to something we all can relate to. And it doesn't make you feel, may make you feel, oh, yeah, but it's not going to make you feel guilty or anything. I, I don't want to go that route and start calling things out. I'm not comfortable in that, actually. Let's go to health, physical health. We know right from wrong with physical health. We know it. One of my most frustrating behaviors of mine, not of anybody else, is when I do so well all day long, all day. Watch what I eat. I, I try to do a little exercise. Um, sometimes I do my walking at night. I get on, and especially in the winter, I do my treadmill at nighttime and my um, um, stationary bicycle at nighttime. And I'll get tonight and I'll start to do some work. And it's so much, I've, here, here's an experiment I've tried. It's so much easier to stay in my chair and keep working on my computer than getting up and getting on the treadmill. Not a big experiment at all. Everyone would, would agree to that. And so I find myself doing that sometimes. I know where I'm supposed to be. I know what's best. I know what's right. And I don't get downstairs. And then 
as I'm on my computer, I unplug my computer and I go into the kitchen. I'm going to have, I, I do my little detox. I do this crazy mixture. I have my detox. And afterwards, I think, I could use some of those chocolate rice cakes in the, in the pantry. And then after it just, just happened last night, and then I think I sure could use little pretzels and mustard. And, and I sit at the table, I do my computer, I'm not doing my exercise, and I start to just nibble snack. Now, I'd rather do those two than ice cream, which also calls me even louder from the freezer. But this is what happens. And I know none of this behavior is good. No gray area. It's either right or wrong, black or white, and I'm choosing wrong. Here's a few facts for you. Less than 5% of adults participate in 30 minutes of daily physical activity. Less than 5% of adults don't even do 30 minutes of exercise a day. I would do one of those on days like yesterday, but I do, we, we do this, we try to do this daily. Less than 33% of adults receive the recommended or do not receive the recommended weekly amount of physical activity. Just X amount of steps, just getting up and walking. One third, not even one third, do the minimum. Less than 23% of American adults meet the basic leisure time activity guidelines. Some of those are this simple, go outside. Go outside and get fresh air. Now, there's reasons some people are shut in. I mean, there's real reasons, but this is a bigger, this is a much broader span. Less than 33% of adults 65 or older are considered, are, are considered physically active. Less than one third of all adults over 65 are even considered active. We know what's right. I told on uh, Tuesday night, we had a conversation. I don't know how we got there, but I talked about just doing flexibility and stretching, how important that is as we get older. And um, Candace will tell you I'm obnoxious when I do it. Once I go downstairs and I do my flexibility stuff and I am the least flexible on this earth, but I do my flexibility and my exercises. Um, I just start walking through the house like I'm, I've just accomplished everything. And I try to tell kids, oh, you got to do some exercises. And she just wants to tape my mouth and say, please leave me alone. But when I do that, I feel great. Which means I should be doing that every single day. And I don't. I'm not speaking to what I'm doing right. I'm speaking to what I'm doing wrong. I know I feel better. And I still don't do it. And it's literally 10 to 15 minutes literally 10 to 15 minutes of, uh, of dedicated uh, exercise. Less than 20% of adults 18 to 64, younger than 65, engage in two and a half hours of physical activity every week. It's amazing, isn't it? Any kind of activity. And then less than 20% of adults in that same age group, 18 to 64, engage in 75 minutes of rigorous physical activity on a weekly basis. Why am I saying that? Because we know the difference between right and wrong. And so many, if not most, choose wrong. I have a phrase, I have a seminar that I do at work, and I've done it for years and years and years. It's called, do the right thing, do the thing right. Two different theories, two different motivations, two different resources, two different reasons. Do the right thing and do the thing right. That's what we're talking about today, right as rain. <coughs> What's amazing as I was thinking this, these thoughts is, I don't even know that I have, I don't even know that I can say I reign over me in righteousness. Because I count physical activity as righteousness. I, found, I found, find that righteousness is not just a behavior um, that's defined by right and wrong, um, sin or not sin, as, as often people define it. But just what you do, just knowing what's best, knowing what to do. Doug, stop texting. I hear that all the time. Doug, stop texting. When do you think I hear that? 
Yes. When my hands, both hands are supposed to be on the steering wheel, someone will text me and it makes a sound. I have to, like a child, turn my sound off so I don't look at my phone. So that while I'm driving, it goes off beside me and I pick it up in the console and look at it and Candace says, Doug, stop texting. I can't even rain over myself. And still undefeated in the world champion, found in First Peter, found in Hebrews 1:8. If you want to write some of these scriptures down, I'm going to share a few scriptures. Reigning champion, undefeated, not to the horrors of the Los Angeles Rams at 29% win rate this year. Not to Attila the Hun and all the names I read to you earlier using their power for evil. This reigning champ, goodness, goodness, goodness. Hebrews 1.8, unto the Son he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. I picture our king sitting on his throne with a scepter of righteousness, standing as he sits with it between his legs reigning in righteousness, never, never pulled left or right, always reigning in righteousness, always ready to disseminate that righteousness to me, to you, to anybody who would ask. If we would but to ask, there is no gray. It's either black or white. It's either right or wrong. Right as rain. And the message today is, are you reigning in rightness? Are you reigning in righteousness? Are you giving in to God's goodness? That comes with rewards, by the way. You know, if he said, just behave yourselves, that's my expectation. He's permitted. It would be okay. But he says, do what I tell you to do, and I'll give you treats. Candace and I watched the dogs the last two days. Uh, Aubrey and um, Aaron went away for the weekend, and we watched the dogs, and we're in heaven with these two dogs for two reasons. We love when they come in the house, and we love when they go out of the house at the end of a day or two. So it's, it's, a, it's kind of a win-win every way around. Um, and I don't think this happens in their house, but we're softies. We should be training them. They're training us. So when we let them out in the backyard, and they come back in, they begin to pummel our thighs, jumping against us, jumping, jumping for treats. And so they have trained us that when they do something good, we give them treats. Word of God says that if we would obey his commandments, he would immediately bless us. Think of that, treats. Lord, come in out of sight. I, I behave myself, treat. If you obey my commandments, I will immediately, immediately bless you. So Cheerio and Oreo live by that commandment, that if we do good, they let us out, we go, out, we go outside and, and do our business outside, we come in, they get a treat. That's our lives. So it's not just that he says, do what I say. He says, do what I say, do the right thing, and I will immediately reward you. You'll get a treat. First Corinthians, excuse me, First Peter, the second chapter, a couple of verses, 22 and 23, speaking of Jesus Christ, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Never. Neither was guile found in his mouth. Never a bad word. Ne a bad thing said. Who, when he was reviled, when he was reviled, the creation reviled the creator. Think of that. We who depend on his goodness treated him in evil, mankind in general. Reading that again, when he was reviled, reviled not again. He didn't send it back. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Committed himself to his father, 
would not give in to the natural side. When I'm harmed, the natural side says, get them back. Wouldn't give in to that. Right as rain, our Savior. 1 Corinthians 15. This is 22, but I want you to read the chapter, so I don't want to give you too much. I'm trying to keep the details away. Maybe you'll go searching for this and read more than I want you to read. 1 Corinthians 15, for it, as in Adam, all die. Love that Paul often uses uh, the first Adam and the second Adam in his explanations. Um, and so the first Adam is Adam and Eve, Adam. The second Adam is Jesus, the Christ. The first Adam is natural. The second Adam is spiritual. The first Adam teaches us how, what not to do. The second Adam teaches us what to do. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits. Tuesday night, I, I, we did a class on Adam and parts on Adam and Eve, and, and certainly parts on Jesus the Christ. And I said, we follow our leader. We follow him into good decision making. We follow him into accountability. He accounted for our sins. We struggle to account for our own. He accounted for all of our sins. Think of that. Tell you that I've told you the experience where I was praying, kneeling before my bed at the end of the day and, and praying for forgiveness. And I could not, I could not say again what I was begging for forgiveness because I had prayed the prayer days and days and days in a row. Was it a huge sin that I was doing? No, I don't even remember what it was. I don't remember whatever it was. I was just asking forgiveness, and I was so embarrassed that it was day three or day seven or day 33. I don't know what it was, but I just remember the phenomenon of being embarrassed before my Lord to say, I'm accountable for my sin, and it's the same sin I've been begging forgiveness for. You forgave me last night. You forgave me the night before. You forgave me the night before that. I can't ask again, and I did. And my good news is, I don't remember what it was, whatever it was, because he forgave me. The Savior took accountability for all of our sins. I couldn't account for one in that moment. So my, my message on Tuesday was that, that we follow him into everything. Our theme was paradise found. The, I'm sorry, the theme was paradise lost. The theme of these statements was paradise found. We all lose paradise. Like Adam and Eve, we are banished from the garden. I want you to hear that. Adam and Eve were, were thrown out of the garden because of sin. And the cherubims were, were put at the east gate, it says, so that they could not return. As is every single person on this earth. We're born into innocence like Adam and Eve. And then we come to a stage of an age of accountability where we know right from wrong and we choose wrong. To be clear, we all choose wrong, all come short, all sin. And those proverbial cherubims are placed at the east gate of our lives, not to re-enter paradise, paradise lost for all of us. And the only way to regain access to the garden is to answer two questions. Do you repent? And do you promise to serve him all the days of your life? And the cherubim step aside. And you re-enter the garden. It's a beautiful song in the I'm a child of the 70s and 60s, so I apologize. But there's a beautiful song from the 70s. It's called Woodstock by Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. And they continue to say, go back to the garden. That's what they're talking about. They're talking about going back to your innocence. Innocence refound. We lose all of that because we choose wrong. Because we don't reign over our own lives in righteousness. We don't have the strength. We know right from wrong. Only the Savior reigned in righteousness. We have access to that, just like we have access to the garden, just like we have access to our innocence. We can recover all of it. Paradise can be found again. 
And so lastly, as, to, as it was on Tuesday night, I said, we follow him into paradise. Prior to his death and resurrection, we had no access to the garden. We had no access to paradise. But it was him who burst through. It was him that the cherubims separated so that the Savior could go back to the Father and give us access to eternal life. But it doesn't come easy. It comes after great decisions are made. Yes, answering yes to both those questions are your first great decisions. But you've got to answer those questions every single day of your life. Do I repent? Do I promise to serve him? Messiah 241. I would desire that you should consider on a bless, on the bless. I'm going to stop interrupting myself. All of a sudden, I become Skip Bayless, and I, or, uh, uh, the coach Skip uh, Holtz. It was, what's his name? Holtz. Lou Holtz. All of a sudden, Lou Holtz, he interrupts himself. It's, it's an old age thing. He interrupts himself all the time. So I'm going to interrupt myself. I told you before, I'm not just going to tell you today to reign in righteousness over your life. I'm not going to tell you today right is reign just as a concept. I'm going to tell you that he's going to give you a treat when you behave yourself. You're well-trained with treats, positive reinforcement. Do good? <laughs> treat. A little more of my spirit. Treat. Keep doing. Whatever you just did, do that again. Here's your treat. Listen to this. Listen to the case made for the positive reinforcement of our Savior. Listen to the case made for those who serve the Lord. Right as rain is a choice because it's worth it. And he's going to tell you in this verse, not just here on earth, but forever. Why would you not choose right? There is no gray area. It's right or wrong, white or black. It's, it's here. Don't get caught up in the gray area and start making excuses. No excuses. Account for who you are. Account for your condition. Did you fail today? Account for that. And beg forgiveness. I didn't stand at the water. And as I was asked, do you repent of your sins? I didn't say, yeah, but let, let me tell you, I wasn't really that bad. Okay, I, I know I'm going to say, yes, I repent, but it really wasn't that bad. That's not accounting. That's excusing. That's gray area. Stay out of the gray. It's right or wrong. And I'm telling you today, our message is right as rain. Messiah 2.41. Lou Holtz is going to let me finish my sentence now. I would desire that you should consider on the blessed and happy state of those that keep the commandments of God. Just consider those who love the Lord and how he blesses them. That's what he's saying. He, black and white. For behold, they are blessed in all things, both temporal and spiritual. Not just spiritual blessings, temporal and spiritual, he says. And if they hold out faithful to the end, they're received into heaven. So here's the case. If you love the Lord, he'll bless you here on earth. And if you love the Lord, he'll bless you in heaven. Short time here, eternity there. All blessings, all good, all happy. That thereby they may dwell with God in a state of never-ending happiness. I can't even understand that. I want you to, I'm confessing to you, I don't know that my brain can understand never-ending happiness. Because even as I'm saying that, and it's coming, my words are now in the air. In my mind already, I'm thinking, you know, every time you're happy, it's something robs it. I'm thinking that right now. I'm trying to convince you to be happy, and I can't finish my thoughts without thinking. But something always interrupts. So when I say dwell with God in a state of never-ending happiness, it's beyond conception. Because we've never seen it. We've never experienced that. We have experience after experience after experience of those who come back to visit in a dream or a vision who say, 
Words like, even if I could return, I wouldn't. I've seen the glory of God. I won't come back. Why? Because they understand what I don't. Never ending happiness. Oh, remember, remember that these things are true for the Lord God has spoken it. This is not Doug. I'm just reading an account. I'm just reading the report. I'm just a messenger to the truth from God's mouth to our ears. This is my promise to you. If you keep my commandments, I will immediately bless you. If you keep my commandments, I have a mansion in heaven. Amazing. Lastly, John 21, 25, write as rain, our Savior. These are not words of discouragement. These are words of encouragement. These are words of courage. I want you to be courageous and take on this message to say, I want to be right as rain. I want to reign over my own life in righteousness. I don't want to give in anymore. Asterisk. Go to the bottom of the page, asterisk, and it says there, but if I do fall, I'll be forgiven and I get to start over. Asterisk up top, and I'm trying my best not to fall. John 21, 25, and there are also many other things. These are the last words of John writing his gospel. These are the last words. This is how he seals his record. He who calls himself the beloved. I knew him best is what he's whispering to us. I love the Lord differently. He loved me differently. He often likes to say he was the love, the one that was loved. So he must have had such a connection with the Savior. And what he's saying is, as as he who was recording his life, I didn't come close. That's what John says. Listen how he says it. John 21, 25, the last verse written about Jesus Christ by John. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which if they should be written, every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Last accounting of John in his account was, I didn't come close to telling you the whole story. We'd still be talking about his experiences if I kept writing. Right as rain. He reigned from start of day to end of day for 33 years and four days in righteousness. Was it Peter who said he had chance to revile against? And he didn't. Those who were taking his life, those who were beating him, those who were scourging him, those who were mocking him, he just received. And at the end of that, after a moment where he felt separation from his father hanging on the cross, why have you betrayed me? Why have you left me? Why have you forsaken me? I love the explanation to that. The father had to turn away because the son had my sins on him. Father couldn't look on his pure son carrying my sins, your sins, our sins. So the father looked away and left him alone in that moment. And after all of that, no complaints, never, just one question. Why'd you forsake me in this moment? I needed this when I needed you most. And I felt most alone. After all of that, he gave his account. His three-word account. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. And John says, if I would have written everything that goes behind that verse, that the world couldn't hold all the books. And how did Jesus give his final accounting? It is finished. Everything you asked me to do. All that you asked me to do, I did it all. I reigned 
over my life. I reigned over sin. I reigned over temptation. I reigned in goodness. Power corrupts absolute. Power corrupts absolutely, except for one who had absolute power. He didn't even use it for his benefit. Could have called down the angels from heaven. He could have taken himself off that cross. He was not be. He would not be corrupted. Why? Because he was right as rain. May the Lord bless each one of you. Search for that rightness. It's waiting for you. And what happens when you, what happens when you follow it? You get a treat. May God bless each one of you.